Welcome everyone. My name is Marika Azoff and I'm the Good Food Institute's Corporate Engagement Lead. So I work with food service companies, chefs, and retailers to help them understand and capitalize on opportunities in alternative proteins. I'm joined by my colleague, Ben Pierce, GFI's phenomenal research analyst, and Sue Fenley, the executive director of Circana, our amazing data partner. And together, we're going to walk you through US plant-based meat food service sales data and consumer research spanning years 2019 to 2022. I'll mention this again, but if you have any questions at all about the data we share today and or would like to learn more about our work with food service operators, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at corporate at gfi.org. So here's the agenda for our time together today. First, we're gonna provide you with a brief introduction to GFI and Circana, as well as the food service landscape. Then Ben will dive into the sales data and consumer insights, and we'll wrap up the presentation by discussing some opportunities in food service. I'll start by sharing a little bit more about the Good Food Institute, or GFI as we call it for short. Uh, we're an international nonprofit reimagining meat production. So what does that mean? What does that look like? We're working across three different programmatic areas, um, science and technology, corporate engagement, and policy to create a sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. So we do this work globally. We work with colleagues in the Asia Pacific region, India, Brazil, Europe, and the United States. And we are a 501c3 nonprofit. We're fully funded by our family of donors, mainly foundations and individuals. And that really allows us to work with stakeholders at no cost and offer resources such as this free of charge. So the key question we're working to address at GFI is how are we going to feed 10 billion people by 2050? And not only how are we going to feed them, but how are we going to do so sustainably, efficiently, and safely? So as global population continues to increase and global incomes continue to rise, so does the demand for protein and more specifically animal protein. Our current animal agriculture systems are responsible for almost 15% of all greenhouse gas emissions. They use 75% of agricultural land while only providing 33% of global protein supply. And they're also the number one user of medically important antibiotics. So we believe that in order to feed 10 billion people by 2050 sustainably, efficiently, and safely, we need to make the meat, seafood, egg, and dairy products that people know and love, but to make them more sustainably and efficiently using alternative proteins. So we're not an advocacy organization. We're not out to change consumers' minds or diets. Instead, we are supporting the alternative protein industry in producing developing and producing delicious, affordable, and accessible products. So now I'll pass things off to Sue Fenley, Executive Director at Circana, to share more about the data behind this report. Oh, thank you so much, Marika. Um, you can go um, over to the next slide. Um, just a little background. My name is Sue Fenley. I'm with uh, Circana, formerly known as the MPD Group. I'm an executive director for our food service industry. My primary role and responsibility is working with food service manufacturers, associations, um, familiarizing them with the detailed uh, data that we do have available across the industry, both in the US and globally. Uh, the two primary sources we used for the study that you'll see in just a bit is supply track and our checkout service. So I'll talk about supply track first because I think that's where the majority of the information came from. Supply track is the first and only POS tracking service for the food service industry that codes, aggregates, and tracks every single thing that's being shipped from a broadline distributor to their end operator partner. So essentially we have a partnership with a number of the broadline distributors you'll see on the next page. They provide us a direct data feed with every single one of their invoices weekly. And we take this information and we scrape all that information off the invoice. Um, and it provides the food service industry a common language to speak to, if you will. Um, our coverage through food service is about $132.5 billion. This is operator dollars spent rather than consumer dollars. 
This has 14 broadline distributors. Um, again, I'll share those with you on the next slide. And it represents over 700,000 operator purchases that are made monthly. And we cover 280 categories in the food service industry. So any food product, um, beverage product, or even disposables equipment we're capturing in here. It encompasses everything that ships through a broadline distributor. Um, the only thing that we're not capturing in, he in here is beverage alcohol. Obviously, our focus for today is plant-based proteins. And we can go to the next slide. <laughs> Just to ground you again, the focus and emphasis of the service is broadline distribution. The 15 broadliners that you see here on this slide, Cisco, U.S. Foods, Reinhardt, PFG, Gordon Food Service, Byright, Shamrock, these are all the participating distributors that provide us that direct data feed to the tune of 2 million transactions weekly. Essentially, what we're tasked with on our end is to code up all of this information consistently. First and foremost, we have to code up all those foods consistently from each and every one of those distributors. This allowing manufacturers, associations, a common language to speak to the industry uh, with. The second thing is that we have the address of the ship to location on uh, the invoice. This allows us to share back an understanding of where products are flowing to throughout the food service industry, whether it's QSR, FSR, commercial, non-commercial, it gets very detailed and granular. Uh, we can go on to the next slide if you don't mind. So I do want to be very clear again, this is through the lens of broadline distribution. So the coverage in broadline distribution is about $146 billion. This encompasses about 86% of broadline food service sales. If we want to blow out the total food service industry and look at that as our universe, we're representing about 42% of what goes to the food service industry in terms of dollars and pound shipments in here. Okay, so it doesn't fully encompass 100% of food service. It does not include chain specialists or specialty distributors, uh, but for really understanding what's being shipped to the street business in food service, it's a very good indicator of the size of categories, whether they're trending up or down, where are some opportunity gaps for different um, categories and brands, if you will. So that is our um, first service. The second service that we'll talk about or is that or that is um, represented in here is called our checkout service. Checkout is our omni panel of consumer information. Think of it as receipt harvesting. We have a large panel of 150,000 um, panelists that take pictures of the receipts and send them to us um, on a daily basis. The wonderful thing about this panel is that it's longitudinal, right? So these panels stay on and maintain it for well over several months, some up to several years. It really gives us an understanding of what exactly the consumer is doing, where they're shopping at. Um, and you know, if they're purchasing a specific food service product from a specific operator, where else are they going for food service options, as well as some of your just standard CPG um, purchases. We can go on to the next. Um, the key things that this checkout panel will help uncover is really the who, what, when, where, and why behind the consumer spend. Um, but because it is longitudinal, it allows us to get even a little bit deeper to really understand consumer responses to specific promotions or LTOs that are being run for the food service um, industry. We can look at penetration rates, visit and fr frequency, attach rates, and promotion. Um, this is going to help you understand from a uh, uh, um, from from the consumer perspective how buyers interact with plant-based products versus competition. May they be animal proteins? Um, so you understand direct or uh, future analytic plans. Also, we can identify a specific operator's key customer and consumer and see when they're not purchasing from, let's say. Um, the Impossible Burger from Burger King, where else they might be purchasing information from. And then looking um, to enhance performance, really understand what's driving growth and decline from um, the largest opportunities to grow. So those are the two um, uh, those are the two services that we'll be discussing today. I appreciate your time and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, it's been such a pleasure working with you and your team over the last several months. 
Um, so now I'm going to set the stage a little bit for the data uh, by talking about the broader food service landscape. So over the last half century, Americans have shifted a major amount of their food purchasing from grocery stores to restaurants. In 1960, the USDA estimates that just 25% of food expenditures came from food away from home, a figure that grew rapidly to reach 56% by 2022. And despite the, the ebbs and flows of this trend over time due to major events such as the 2008 recession and most recently the COVID-19 pandemic, the long-term trajectory appears to be one of sustained growth for the food service sector. And as we saw in the last slide, food service has really bounced back significantly from many of the challenges it faced during the pandemic. Um, however, it still faces significant inflation-related supply chain and labor challenges, to just name a few. Inflation has been a major challenge for food service operators. A morning consult survey found that 83% of U.S. adults reported that they've made changes to the way they eat and drink and cited eating out as at a restaurant less often as one of those changes. Operators have also cited meat as the top ingredient or product experiencing inflation when they're sourcing. The war in Ukraine, crop failures, elevated energy costs, et cetera, have all contributed to price increases for both plant and animal proteins. And a 2022 Data Central report found that recruiting and hiring hourly staff and rising labor costs were some of the top challenges for operators behind food costs and inflation. And the food service industry is a crucial part of the alternative protein puzzle. So food service is where innovation is tested. It's where food trends emerge. Food service eliminates the need for consumers to go buy a package of multiples and then bring it home, figure out how to cook it, prepare it and serve it and eat it. Um, and ideally in food service settings, the food is prepared by professionals in a way that best highlights the ingredients. And this increases the likelihood that consumers first encounter with a new product is positive and that they will then continue to purchase that product, whether it's in a food service or retail setting. Food service is also an incredibly valuable channel for brands for the reasons that I just touched upon, but also because they can really gain valuable feedback on how their product is performing in a food service setting when they launch in food service. GFI is incredibly excited to be able to share valuable food service data and insights with you. And with that, I will pass things to Ben to really dive into the plant-based meat of the presentation. Thanks, Marika. And with that overview, yeah, let's dive right into plant-based protein sales in the food service channel. So before we do that, again, just want to lay out a quick uh, outline and reminder of, of what Sue mentioned um, is, is captured in, in these insights. So um, we leveraged Circana's supply track tool to look at sales of plant-based proteins, and we'll see specifically what that category looks like, as well as um, Circana's checkout tool to look at consumer insights related specifically to plant-based meat alternative buyers in the in food service environments. So just a quick reminder there and um, and want to reinforce again, um, as Sue mentioned, that the sales data will be captured at that wholesale broadline distributor to operator level. And with that, let's let's dive right into the insights. So as Marika discussed, the food service sector experienced significant volatility due to consumer behavior changes during the pandemic. Plant-based protein saw major declines in 2020, with pound sales falling 20% from the prior year as the pandemic hit, and an impact that was felt across animal-based meat and other food categories in the channel. Now, fast forwarding to 2022, plant-based protein dollar sales have fully recovered from 2019 levels, now up 8%, while pound sales were just shy of previous highs, previous highs down 1%. Now, this decline in pound sales is in line with animal base, the animal-based meat category over the same time frame. However, we see in animal-based meat that dollar sales grew 25% from 2019 to 2022. So this gap that we see between dollar sales and pound sales reflects major price increases, particularly for animal-based meat. And here we see how key plant-based meat categories stack up against their conventional counterparts when it comes to average prices per pound, again, at that wholesale level. So despite price increases having an outsized impact on animal-based meat in recent years, plant-based proteins still sit at a significant premium at the wholesale 
level and incidentally um, the, the consumer level level or what's showing up uh, on consumers plates. And looking at prices across the food sector over the last five years, we see that food away from home or food service prices have increased steadily from 2018 and into 2023, while food at home or, or often food purchased in retail environments has experienced more volatility, volatility, notably declining headed into 2023. So elevated prices across commodities, especially in food, are likely to continue to play an important role in consumer purchasing behavior as they turn to more affordable options. And this poses a challenge for plant-based proteins, as we saw that sit at a, a on the previous slide that sit at a significant premium to animal-based meat. And closing this this price gap while solidifying plant-based products value proposition are key opportunities for the category going forward. So now that we've seen how plant-based proteins have performed over the last four years, let's take a look at the category in food service. So the plant-based proteins category is, is dominated by a select few product types and formats. Together, plant-based beef products, tofu, and grain nut veggie products, such as bean burgers, for example, captured nearly 80% of all pound sales in 2022. The most popular format these, these products are delivered in, as you might have guessed, are patties, which make up 43% of all pound sales. Now, it's important to note that there is likely less variety in product formats captured here, given these sales represent the wholesale level, therefore not necessarily representing how these foods show up on consumer plates. Tofu, for example, often represented in blocks here, um, but can come in a variety of different formats and, and presentations um, at the consumer level. Still, this highlights meaningful opportunities for the category to expand on ingredient types and diversify product offerings to meet uh, ever-changing consumer needs. As we've seen at retail, in food service, plant-based protein products that aim to match the taste, texture, and function of animal-based meat, defined on this slide as analogs, have overtaken more vegetable-forward items like bean or veggie burgers and tofu, defined as non-analogs here. So from 2019 to 2022, the analogous products went from just under 40% of all plant-based protein pound sales to the majority at 53% in 2022. Now, this highlights the importance of formulating products and dishes and menu items that look, smell, and taste like animal-based meat as consumers are increasingly turning to these items. And some of the surge seen in more analogous products can be attributed to these growing segments in the plant-based proteins category. Plant-based chicken, plant-based pork, plant-based seafood, although representing relatively small shares of the category, have seen exponential growth since 2019. Plant-based chicken, namely, has more than doubled its dollar sales over that time frame and reached 11% share of the total category. So as we've seen at retail, again, operators are expanding beyond the veggie burger and are experimenting with new formats and flavors to reach more consumers and keep them engaged beyond just an initial trial. Some notable launches and limited time offers in these emerging formats include the ones you see on this slide. Here we see examples of how new products are playing a meaningful role in expanding and evolving the plant-based protein category in food service. So we see things like um, chorizos and um, plant-based steaks, plant-based seafood, um, really highlighting uh, the variety that's being added to this channel. So now that we've discussed what makes up this category, let's look at where these foods uh, are showing up across the sector. Again, as a reminder, because this data captures only broadline distributor sales, figures do tend to skew a bit towards non-commercial environments and away from larger chains that might leverage their own distribution networks. Still, these are important indicators of where plant-based proteins are showing up in food service. So in, in 2022, nearly 40% of all plant-based protein pound sales came through quick service restaurants and the green percentage here indicating that this over indexes relative to the total food space. Similarly, education environments play an outsized role in the category, seeing a resurgence after particularly sharp declines in 2020 as a result of schools turning to remote learning. Solidifying and honing the presence of plant-based proteins in major food service channels like QSRs, uh, FSRs, and education environments, uh, while also expanding into important opportunity areas like healthcare and businesses will be key to the growth and long-term success of this category. So now moving from the sales data, we'll now explore insights from the consumer buyer analysis, looking specifically at plant-based meat alternative consumers in food service. As a reminder, this section will cover a buyer analysis of receipt data uh, from Circana's checkout tool of specifically plant-based meat alternative buyers in the food service channel. 
So in 2022, nearly one in 10 U.S. food service buyers purchased a plant-based meat alternative product uh, at food service. On average, these folks purchase these items just two to three times. And as we can see on this slide, the majority of those folks purchasing um, in the category just one time uh, over the course of the year. Now, despite these relatively low figures, consumers do appear eager for more plant-based options on menus. For example, Mintel found that half of omnivores and eight in 10 flexitarians agree that the more restaurant agree that more restaurants should serve plant-based meat alternatives. So these trends underscore the need to continue in investing in developing and expanding plant-based menu items that taste as good or, or better and cost the same or less than animal-based meat. Improvements on this front will help attract and retain consumers to this nascent category. And one reason for operators to lean into plant-based meat alternatives is that buyers of these items appear to be among the most engaged food service customers. So here we see that in 2022, buyers of plant-based meat alternatives visited food service environments um, roughly 30 more times and spent roughly $400 more than the average food service buyer, demonstrating the value that plant-based meat alternatives have on the menu. Recent launches and limited time offers at major food service chains highlight uh, just how operators are leaning into plant-based to capitalize on the potential of this category. And here we see LTOs or limited time offers. And there are a lot of reasons um, to utilize an LTO from testing new flavor profiles to showcasing items that might get added to the permanent menu to offering holiday or seasonal specials. So again, continuing to expand on product offerings, improving taste and bringing down prices will be uh, key and important to getting more customers in the door and keeping them coming back uh, for these products. And now I'll pass it back to Marika to close things out. Awesome, thanks so much, Ben. Yeah, to wrap things up, I'm going to highlight some of the opportunities that really stood out to us when we were analyzing the sales data and consumer research that Ben just shared with us all. So we all saw the repeat purchase slide um, a couple slides ago. And while consumers are expressing demand for more plant-based meat alternatives on menus, the majority of them won't reorder a dish that doesn't meet or exceed their taste and texture expectations. So there remain significant opportunities to improve the taste and texture of plant-based proteins, both on the brand side and on the operator side. Um, so ensuring that that the ingredients are um, served in a way that best highlights their, their flavor and other attributes. In addition to taste, price is often cited in the consumer research as another leading barrier to plant-based protein consumption. So as Ben said, closing that price gap, and especially during inflationary times, will help make plant-based alternatives more accessible to more people. If plant-based proteins are still being sold at a premium, operators also have an opportunity to share through marketing and messaging why it's worth it to their consumers to pay that premium. So that's gonna look different for different operators depending on which attributes are most important to their consumer base or the consumer bases they're trying to appeal to, um, whether that's tapping into the health benefits of plant-based proteins or telling a sustainability story um, or something else. There are also opportunities for operators to weave plant-based and other alternative proteins into their sustainability goals, their CSR goals, um, and, and to set targets. So for example, many of the large US food service management companies such as Sodexo and Aramark have made robust commitments to make cer a certain percentage of their menus plant-based by a certain date. So commitments such as these can help consumers use alternative proteins to meet their sustainability goals um, and also appeal to a growing consumer base. And as we saw on a previous slide, the majority, majority of plant-based proteins sold to food service operators today are still beef analogs in the patty form. So as brands and operators expand and diversify plant-based offerings while ensuring that they meet consumers' uh, taste, texture, and price needs, of course, operators will be able to appeal to consumers who aren't looking for, um, or who are looking for menu items beyond that burger. And lastly, consumer research across the board shows that younger generations are the most interested in plant-based proteins. So maintaining and growing these demographics openness to and adoption of plant-based proteins and other alternative proteins could be a major long-term growth strategy for food service operators. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, to learn more, 
to ask any questions you may have. Again, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at corporate at gfi.org. Also check out our uh, resources, our other resources at gfi.org. I've included a link to our newsletter here as well as our 2022 State of the Industry reports. Thank you again, and we look forward to talking to you soon.